Hi everyone, it's Amy here from the blog I Think Therefore I Teach. Welcome to your next criminology instalment. This one is for Unit 3 and we are now venturing to 3.1, our penultimate topic. You're nearly there. Right, let's make me smaller. So this is a really good one. It's also worth quite a few marks so this is an important one it is examine information for validity there are a number of things you need to do within this and make sure that you do in order to get your marks and we're going to go through that very very carefully so topic 3.1 part of unit 3 the first thing I got my students to do was to rank these sources of information, these sources that we are going to happen to be looking at, in order of trustworthiness, so from highest to lowest. So how trustworthy are they? How trustworthy are they when coming to make a decision about whether somebody is guilty or not? And to help them consider, I got them to think about, is the information likely to be accurate or inaccurate? Is it factual or opinion? Is it biased or impartial? Biased meaning being your own personal views or impartial meaning you remove your views from it. So one being the highest for um, trustworthiness and um, seven being the lowest for trustworthiness. And so we then had a discussion about what we thought um, and the class were generally within the same area. So they generally, the, the majority all went with down roughly down the same decision. We had a bit of differences around the kind of three to three to five. There was a few changes. Um, but generally, my class number one was the forensic evidence. Go with the evidence. Um, the second was... I think it was testimony of experts was I think the most popular one for the second um, and then going down to social media and tabloid press being the, the least trustworthy um, I think with social media being the bottom for trustworthy over tabloid because tabloids still have to express some fact even if it's um, completely exaggerated whereas social media you can write anything you want so let's have a look. This topic, we will examine the following sources of information for validity. Evidence, physical, testimonial and expert, trial transcripts, the media, court judgments and law reports. We will review each one of these and make judgments about the suitability. We will examine them for validity in terms of bias, opinion, circumstance, currency, accuracy. We will refer to case studies to do this. Now, this is extremely important. When you are writing your controlled assessment, my advice is to structure it via the, 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 the evidence, trial transcripts, etc. So have a subheading for each of them. Evidence, make sure you've got one small paragraph on each, the physical, testimonial and expert. And then you have to use the terms validity throughout. This shows validity. This questions validity. This... Um, this leads to a decision being made about the validity and you have to use those five words throughout. You have to use them. And so if it's biased, this questions the validity. If um, opinion um, questions the validity, the currency questions the validity. So let's have a look at what those words actually mean now. That this is a topic where you need to apply the ideas to the brief in the control assessment. Again, that is extremely important. You will not get top band if you don't talk about the brief or the short story that you'll get in your exam. You have to link this to the brief. So what I got my students to do is I got them to Google, find a Google definition of validity. What does it actually mean? I then got them to look at the synonyms. What words are similar to validity? And so they might have found words like legitimacy, legality, soundness, authority, grounds, um, persuasiveness, power, right, strength. So these are all words that are synonyms of validity. They also have some very good definitions for validity as well. And so what I got them to do was I got them to pick two synonyms, either the ones that I put there on the slide or their own, and write how each of them, uh, it should be each of them, sorry, not each of the uh, each the theme, each of them would affect a criminal case. So in order for evidence to be legitimate, legitimate, legitimacy, it must be collected in the correct way. So that's using the word legitimate, it's linking it to evidence um, and so therefore and then saying that it must be collected in the right way in order for it to be legitimate. So I got them to do it twice with two different synonyms and linking it back to 
one of the areas or two of the areas um, on the other side of the slide. So things like your evidence, your transcripts, your, um, you know, the media portrayal, etc. This topic then, we're taking a critical approach to the information we are given, not just trusting that things as accurate or trustworthy. There are a number of key elements for assessing validity. These include currency, circumstance, accuracy, bias and opinion. These words must be used throughout this topic, including when discussing case studies and the brief. So, circumstances links to the circumstances in which the evidence, for example, was gathered, received, noted down. So, it's the circumstances around it um, so this could be an eyewitness statement it could be the way that the witness's statement is taken it could be where the evidence has been found so it's all to do with the circumstances surrounding it currency how up to date is it how current is it um, how current is the evidence how current is the information i then got them to look at synonyms for the following words bias opinion and accuracy what do the words imply what do they show what do they mean so bias again has the individual that's been taking these things down brought a level of bias to it has the jury brought the media brought level of bias opinion is it based on somebody's opinion? So, for example, expert witnesses present their opinions. Is that opinion valid or not? Is it reliable, trustworthy or not? And accuracy. How accurate is what is being said true? How accurate is the evidence that's being collected? How accurate is the media portrayal? So, again, synonyms help you with them. Um, or oh, just on a side note as well, um, avoid using synonyms, though, in your controlled assessment. Use those words. Don't be fancy. Even if you've used the word circumstance, loads and loads, don't change it. Use the word circumstance. Use the word currency. When I'm marking my control systems for my students, those are the words I am looking for. So, validity of evidence. Apologies, I should have timed this one slightly better. Validity of evidence then. Physical, witness testimonial and expert. Physical, normally valid if collected, transferred, stored and analysed correctly by personnel. If you remember... 2.1 or 1. I think it's 1.3, 1.3, you go through all of that. So um, you know about that, and so it's valid if it's collected in the correct way. The CPS vet the evidence to check that it passes the evidential test of the full code test. So again, we've looked at that in a previous topic as well. Um, but it has to, it's collected that it has to pass the test. Witnesses and testimonial. Uh, validity can be affected by things like mistaken identity, the innocence pr uh, project findings, uh, memory erosion, leading questions, discussions of events with others. So Loftus and Palmer found that. Weapons focus, interpretation of events. So what that means is, is that validity can be affected by many, many things. The weapons focus I've mentioned before is basically when there is a weapon being used, like a knife, the witness focuses on the knife, not the person, because the knife is what's threatening them, that are the knife knife is you know evolutionary what you need to watch and be careful of so you focus so much on the knife you don't actually focus that much on the person wielding the knife uh, memory erosion your memory does erode yes when you have had trauma your memory is quite clear and quite specific but you still forget things you forget the small elements the little details if there's leading questions for example this could really change the way that you remember and recount those situations so leading questions police have to be extremely careful when interviewing that they do not ask leading questions um, and finally expert generally regarded as having good validity as they should be objective and draw on evidence of years of experience they are trained they are experts pathologists for example forensic scientists these people are trained they know what they're talking about they have no benefit from lying um, they just present what they know as part of their job and so generally they're fairly valid however this isn't guaranteed experts can make mistakes um, and it could be a concern for their reputation so what I got my students to do then and this took us a while this took us a while to get our heads around it and to get it to get it to get it really right so this might take you a little bit of time I got them to pick one case study that they could specifically apply to each one of those. They were able to use the same case study more than once. And I got them to explain using specific details. That's extremely important. By specifics, I want names. I want dates. I want details of the evidence that you are talking about. When did they find it? How did they find it? I want specifics. 
um, and how valid uh, the evidence is using the words currency, bias, circumstance, accuracy and opinion. And again, sometimes the evidence you could link to multiple words. So, for example, we looked at... Um, the Amanda Knox, I always go back to the Amanda Knox case, Amanda Knox and Meredith Kirch case. Um, the when you look at the physical evidence, such as the bra strap, the circumstance was it wasn't originally found, it was found 47 days later, so therefore it's not current, it could have been contaminated. Um, so so that works for 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 a couple of those terms. The expert, obviously, you've always can go back to the Sally Clark experts of Sir Roy Meadows uh, and the paediatrician. Again, it was their opinion. The statistic given by Sir Roy Meadows wasn't actually accurate. Um, the the paediatrician, his first view was that the first child died of natural causes. He then changed that in order to say, actually, when the second one's happened, there's, there's cause for concern. That, again, could have shown a bit of bias um you know towards the situation uh, and again he's going back to a previous case so that one wasn't that current but again it was the same person situation so you can you cannot get this wrong you cannot get this wrong as far as if you can make a specific link and use those words and justify those words you could make hundreds of different links use hundreds of different cases hundreds of different examples and you'll be right with all of them um so Again, with witnesses or testimonial, you could use Dwayne, who was with Stephen Lawrence. You could use uh, Bromley, who was the witness for um, uh, Damilo Taylor. Um, and so there are, there are different things that, um, that, that you can talk about with these. I then introduce myself. Uh, introduce myself. I then introduce my students to the final case study that we looked at um, in depth, and this was the Jeremy Bamber case. Highly recommend it. I am completely split on my decision with this one. Um, it's a really good one if you've not already come across it. For for me, the evidence is questionable as far as whether the evidence points to him or not. Um, they found him. No, actually, I, I won't give you. I won't tell you the the end outcome because you might want to watch it. But I'm not sure if the evidence accurately links up with the decision that was made. Um, final case will explore this unit. Please make notes on all evidence so that we can apply our validity ratings to it afterwards. Number two, then, the validity of trial transcripts. What are they? They are documented proceedings in Crown Court trials used by, used to be a stenographer, so a typist, and now it's done digitally. You can request a copy. They are made to ensure rights of accused uh, if they want to appeal. They help the parole board when they want to review the advice of the judge about the risk posed by the defendant or, release, or on release. So basically, it's the transcripts of everything that was said during the trial. Um, are they valid then? Uh, and I got them to apply the rankings uh, towards whether the students saw these as valid or not. Um, pretty much though, they are highly valid. But you can't just say that. You have to work through each of those to say why they are or are not valid. So for example, currency, they are taken immediately every moment of that trial bias there is no trap there is no bias they are simply just typing or recording everything that he's said so again it is highly accurate because nothing is changed nothing is tampered with it is just a record a transcript of what is said very rarely problems like poor sound or technical malfunctions because again it's it's a very straightforward recording so it's not highly technical and normally goes completely to plan. My students didn't look at a case study for this one specifically because trial transcripts are things that we can't really get hold of and generally even if you did get hold of them um, they would still follow those things. Number three, the validity of media reports. In the case studies we have seen, how has the media shown political bias cause moral panics or demonstrate stereotyping. So again, I've got my students to discuss and write down all the different ways they've shown stereotyping. They might have shown some political bias towards uh, over-representing certain crimes more than others. Moral panics, don't forget moral panics from previous topics. So how have they represented these? The media can play an influential role in providing information about the crime. The media are still useful. Whatever we say, we find out what is going on through the media. So even if 
the information about the crime is biased, as we'll look in a minute, maybe it's exaggerated, etc. It's still some information we would not get as a general public. Journalists often investigate and report on crime stories as they affect the public or public interest. However, it's important to consider that particular source of media and critically evaluates its validity. And this is because there can be significant bias in media reporting, either international or uh, sorry, either international, either intentional or unintentional. The newspapers are still written by a person. A person wants to sell those papers. They are going to write it in a way that that, that glorifies, emphasizes, exaggerates. Um, these um, these areas, these things, because they want to sell the papers. Newspapers in Britain, they tend to support one political perspective, either left wing or right, right wing. As a result, reporting tends to reflect this. For instance, the Sun and the Daily Mail are more conservative leaning, therefore it's quite a hard line, tough justice position on crime, uh, whereas uh, obviously other newspapers might lean more towards um, you know, Labour. Newspaper journalists are free to express opinion and make judgments and their reports may be affected by bias. They can put their opinions in there. Basically, it's like social media but on paper. Uh, they can make judgments. So... Yes, they're educated, but they're also just journalists. These people have no legal backing. They're not, um, you know, they haven't necessarily spoke to the lawyers and the barristers, etc. You know, these are these are journalists. They want the juice. They want the gossip. Television and radio in the UK should be free from political bias and, re and present an impartial way. However, some critics argue that this is not always the case. So recently, BBC have been criticised for being biased towards the right wing. I then got my students to use previous cases that we've done, including Christopher Jeffries, Colin Stagg, Barry George and the Hillsborough cases, and to write down the validity of newspaper, TV and radio reporting and applying our five things, of course, all the way through. Um, I, when I got my students, when I say about specifics, I got them to write the specific newspapers, the specific dates. So when they were taught and I got them to quote what was on the front page. So, for example, that one there for the Daily Mirror, I, I need to see my students put in the Daily mirror on this date so obviously you can't see it on that one but they'd have to zoom in um it accuses christopher jeffries of or the headline is joe suspect is peeping tom this can be shown as an opinion because blah 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 newspapers obviously are fairly current so that's good but um the circumstances of writing them they want to sell papers they might not have been able to get the information from them in a very good way. Um, so the circumstances of how they've actually got the information, the accuracy, where's this information come from, um, etc, etc. Um, and then No Girl Is Safe, that was the Colin Stagg case. So um, again, have a look, how was he spoke about, how was it dealt with? Uh, and then Barry George is another one. Um, Hillsborough, again, who did, they, who did the newspapers blame it on? Obviously, the football supporters, what did they call them, etc. So you get a, you've got a lot of fantastic cases that you can use very well for this. Um, I then go on to read and make notes on the article, BBC accused of political bias on the right, not to the left. So again, you can check that one out. Validity of court judgments. There are a variety of factors affecting the validity of judgments made in court, including those from the judge and the jury. Not always accurate. Sometimes this stems from attitudes, opinions or unconscious bias from people on the jury. You might not know you're biased. Political opinions then are political bias. It has been shown that if a person on a jury thinks that sentences are too lenient, so again, again going down quite the conservative route, then there's a higher likelihood that they might find the defendant guilty. Uh, attitudes towards race, race bias, unconsciously, there may have stereotypes that can affect verdicts. In the US, a video game simulation showed white police officers are more likely to shoot an unarmed black person than an unarmed white person. Attitudes towards gender or gender bias. Sometimes assumptions are made about the character of rape victims, for example, um, um, and this has influenced jury decisions. For instance, Ellison and Munro found the emotion the victim showed in court affected the verdicts that were made. 
Think about it in the Jeremy Bamber case. Um, Jeremy Bamber's uh, ex-girlfriend got on the stand, gave a full weeping, moping, mopey story, and the jury really went down her down on her side. You know, they really supported what she was saying. Maybe at the expense of not listening properly to what she was saying, or really considering the fact that he dumped her a month later, she then comes forward with information. This section you need to talk about inquests. Inquests are the best thing to talk about for court judgments. If a person dies in police custody or due to the actions of a public organisation, police, prison service, etc., some people argue there is a lack of objectivity in the inquest. The inquest is finding out what happened. This is because the public organisations such as the police receive state representation whereas the families of those who died do not so they can get the best legal team. This is the concern of the campaign group inquest which argues that there is an inherent bias in the system and obviously the key and lead example is Hillsborough. Hillsborough will always be the example for something like this. There are many others though you could look in the inquest of Mark Duggan but Hillsborough is years of fighting against the system and so what I got my students to do was to look at the first and second inquest and look at the what was said what was what was the decisions that were made the accuracy and the opinion this might overlap with some of the earlier things you've also mentioned but as far as the court judgments are concerned where was the bias where was the accuracy the currency uh, the opinion so there's a lot of things within within Hillsborough where the judgments that were made by the court are questionable Finally, law reports. Uh, we have what is called the principle of precedent, which is fundamental to our legal uh, system. Our legal system works based on the interests of justice, fairness and consistency, we hope. Verdicts and decisions on sentences are influenced by what has happened in, past, in the past in similar cases. This is really interesting, is this? What this means is that if someone is accused of the same crime as someone in the past, similar circumstances, and they were found guilty, the judge will base the sentence on that decision that was made previously. So if one person 10 years ago in the same situation killed somebody, and now you have a case where it's very, very similar, somebody has killed somebody, similar circumstances, uh, they, they're going to sentence them the same. They're going to find them guilty. They're going to give them the same sentence. This provides consistency. If new circumstances come to light and decisions are being made for the first time, then a, pr a new principle of law is set down. A new precedent is set. So I've got my students to think about where new laws were made. And obviously you've got things like Sarah's law um, that was made. You, you have many, many laws that have come about where new presents have to be set. Or where old laws have changed and therefore, again, new presents have to be set. So, um, for example, the double jeopardy, that was an old law. But because you changed the law, you had to then change the president, etc., Therefore, so that all legal experts can be aware of the precedent, law reports are made regularly so that everyone can be updated. So there's no good if these are regula regularly updated. If somebody has applied the new law, they have a, a new law, Sarah's law, for example, and they've um, uh, given the information out. And then, I mean, Sarah's law is not really because whether you're a paedophile, you're a paedophile and you'll go down that same route but uh, so let's let me give you a different example so if somebody has done something that is now found um, illegal in one area but the law report isn't up to date and then someone else in another area does the same thing and the law report hasn't been up to date they may give completely two different sentences that's not fair it doesn't matter where you are in the country you have to follow the same law report so then law reports are extremely up to date sometimes this happens weekly however only two percent of cases are documented in law reports because they are novel in some way so basically they are updated weekly but that update rarely happens because they just don't need to the, there is very very few new cases that are totally new so there's very few times when novel things happen the law report should be full detailed account of all relevant information needed it will include details of the case a summary of the case of the law uh, that's been taken into account the court judge decisions a transcript of the precise words used by the judge in the making of their judgment is also included 
you need an absolute broken down step by step of what happens so that anybody anywhere else in the country can read that and go right my case is similar this is what i do are they valid yes they should be um they are current because they're made as soon as possible as the case happens they're objective and unbiased again this is just a pure detailed summary of what happens a summary of the law um, so they are objective and unbiased the person writing it all up typing the report up is not putting their own opinions on it or not changing anything they're just literally typing everything that happened in the case the facts the statistics the evidence they are accurate in their detail of what happened and what was said they contain the opinions of the court but not the person writing them so again the opinions of the court might not be valid but that's the number three this is just purely about the person writing the transcript and therefore they pass no opinion. So therefore they are valid within themselves, even if the data source that they come from is not valid, the reports themselves are valid. Okay, I hope you found this one useful. Do not forget you have to use the right language throughout. So please make sure what I got my students to do is I got them to highlight on their sheets where they've used those words because again, um, I, I said it to my class a lot. I wrote it on the board. What you think you do and what you actually do are two completely different things. You might think you're using the words and you're not. Do not use synonyms. Use the words valid, currency, bias, opinion, etc. Um, thumbs up if you like the video. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss. And if you have any comments or questions, please post below. And if you do watch the Jeremy Bamber case, pop in what you think, uh, because I am still very uh, undecided when it comes to is he guilty or not guilty. So if you, uh, if you do check Jeremy Bamber out, maybe drop me a comment as to what you think. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Bye for now, folks.